to be here. Tell you what. It's funny sometimes the stuff I hear when it comes to church. You know, well, it was a really long service, Pastor. Yeah, I know that two hours was rough today, wasn't it? I had a guy say to me one time, my, my good friend John, he says to me, you know. I said, what? He says, they say that the mind can only endure or understand what the seat can endure. I said, that right? He said, yeah. I said, how long did you sit in that tree stand yesterday? He said, never mind. <laughs> you see, when you love something, time doesn't constrain it. Passion for God, passion for God's people, passion for the house. I, I, I'm going to tell my day yesterday. So I get up about 7 o'clock. I leave the house at 8.15 in the morning. I pick up my mother and Harry. We drive to Clearfield. We sit there until 3.30, 3.45. We drive home, get home, quarter to 5, all to watch Carson swim for less than three minutes in a swimming pool. <laughs> a total of five events, less than three minutes. And I know some of you say, oh, I love to watch swimming. No, I love to watch Carson. The rest of it I could care less. I'm just telling you, okay? Right? <laughs> I, got, I like to go to baseball games because I like watching baseball. But less than three minutes. And you know what? Why do I do it? Because it's a labor of love. Because I love her that much. That I'm going to go and I'm going to sit and I'm going to endure. And it's going to cost me eight hours of my day. And it's going to cost me money after money at the concession stand. <laughs> yes, she's worth it. Absolutely. I, I, and I tell you what, and, and I'm always supporting the cause. I buy food. I buy this. I buy 50-50 tickets. I buy 50-50 tickets to everything I go to, not to win, just to give money. But I'm going to tell you something. I just like to come close just once. <laughs> I can't even get the right color ticket. They'll start the announcement. We're going to say, hey, we got the 50-50 winner, and it's an orange ticket. Mine's purple. <laughs> Matter of fact, sometimes I don't even get, like, like Steffi was selling 50-50 tickets the other night at the Little League game. She gave me six less than her dad. Six. No wonder I didn't win. It's amazing. Sometimes, I'm not meddling. I'm just saying, put things in perspective. God is the most important thing in our life. We are the most important to him. Therefore, he should be the most important to us. And yet, sometimes, let's be honest, he doesn't get the best of it, does he? Just sometimes. And now I'm going to tell you something else, too. That little sucker got me again. I'm telling you, she's a pool shark, not in a shooting pool, a swimming pool shark. She dropped nine seconds in one race. You know what that cost me yesterday? $18. $18. The race before that, she dropped 10 in one. That was $20. You know, when you, when you got the couple races where she's dropping, oh, a second here and two seconds there, I'm telling her, okay, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you $2 for every second you drop. Next thing I know, she drops 10 seconds at a time. <laughs> Minnesota Carson. <laughs> oh, but I wouldn't have it any other way. Amen. Amen? Peter did a great job last week, great message, Pastor. I even listened to most of it. Great message on Samson, and I can't remember how you said the one thing about him working in the anointing but not living in righteousness or something along those lines. Really good. I mean, if I almost remembered it. <laughs> one of the things, amazing things about Samson's life is he had the charisma of God, which is the gifts of God, and yet character is the caretaker of charisma. And it's amazing how his character caused him to mess with the charisma. I want to talk to you today a little bit. I was just pondering scripture, and Bonnie tried to mess me up this morning. She sent me something this morning I almost preached on. But I want to talk to you about the innocent one today. The innocent one. How many of you have ever said, I'm innocent? Okay. <laughs> How many of you have ever been accused of something, and you've declared your innocence? I've done it many times, and nobody believes me. Years ago, Mike and Bethany started here as the pastors. Bethany did a great job last week, by the way. When you see her, tell her, great job. 
Thank you to all of you who helped with VBS, did a great job. It was really well run, loved it. Man, she's such a blessing to us. You know, I'm just amazed at how God blesses me, blessed me for 20 years with Pastor Chris, and now he's blessed us with uh, Pastor Bethany. Years ago, when they first moved here and they first started working for us, I was driving past her house one snowy day. And my mother was with me, and all of a sudden I went, slammed on the brakes. She said, what are you doing? I'm going back. She said, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going back there. they got a snowman in the front yard. So I took the head off the snowman, and I put it on their front porch. <laughs> then I left. And for months, I kid you not, for months they tried to figure out who killed their snowman. For months, they were blaming DJ Dunio, they were blaming Rusty, they blamed everybody. For months, they were blaming everybody. And the, what made it bad was, when they went and let the dog out, the dog then peed on the snowman's head. <laughs> so finally, one day, I had a guest speaker, Pastor Tommy Reed, one day, and I said, you know what, confession is good for the soul, right? And so I said, Mike and Bethany, I need you to come up front to the church. And they come up in the front, I need to confess. Okay. It was me. I killed your snowman. <laughs> I'll never forget the look on her face. <gasps> I had to confess. I was not the innocent one. But how many, times, how many times in your life have you said, I'm innocent, only to mean you weren't innocent? I'm going to take you back to the beginning. You know, I preach a lot out of both Testaments. What I mean by that is I love to use the old and the new together. I think there's great continuity there. I think one brings the other alive. I, I just love to tie the two together as much as I can. And so I want to take us back to the beginning. In the book of Genesis, God creates everything, the heavens, the earth. He creates the sun, the moon, the stars. He creates Adam. He creates Eve. All right? And now there's a verse in Genesis chapter 2, 25. It says this. And the man and his wife were both naked, but they were not ashamed. You know what that tells me? I always think about this. Every time I read this verse, you know what this tells me? There were no mirrors in the garden. <laughs> I'm, I mean, I'm just telling you, brother. I'm just telling you, sister. I'm just telling you. Right? And the man and his wife were both naked, but they were not ashamed. You see, let us understand something. God had created humanity. He created humanity to take role and dominion over the earth. He created, I believe he created Adam and Eve to offset the works of Satan, which I won't get into that. But what I want to show you is that man was created to live in a state of uncontaminated nakedness. You, you see, they were created to live in a state of innocence. How, how many of you know today that God's intention for humanity was not create them so they live in a state of sin? Was not so they would create them so they would live in a state of shame? They would have a, they weren't even to know evil. How many of you tried to protect your children for as long as you could from anything that would contaminate their innocence? Yeah. Isn't there something refreshing about the innocence of a child? That man, they can just rip off those clothes and they can just run through the house and they can run through the house unashamed, not even given a second thing about it. They could care less. I, I, walked in, I walked into the, I had the kids on Tuesday and Wednesday, and I walked into the other side of the house on Tuesday. Liam was getting dressed. I said, go get dressed, man. Okay. So it took him a few minutes. Finally, I'm like, okay, I better go see where he's at. Now, the clothes were laying on the chair by the island. So I walk in, and there he is standing on the island in his underwear. It's your child. Okay. Now, unbeknown to him that he could have cared less, but there is something about this whole state of innocence that you try to keep your children in as long as you can. That's why you protect them from certain shows, from particular channels. That's why you protect them, at least you should, right? This is what God did. When God created Adam and Eve, everything is yours to eat, but that tree there, mine. Don't eat from it. That one has the knowledge of good and evil. And the last thing you need is the knowledge of evil. Because let me tell you something. One thing man cannot handle is the knowledge of evil. How many know we cannot be stewards of evil? What we do with evil, what we do with the knowledge of it is amazing. And so man was created to live in a state of innocence, in a state of unashamed nakedness, in this place where they would live not knowing what they didn't know. 
Come on. Isn't there, isn't there a bliss when you can literally say, I don't know. I told Penny in 1999 when this church allowed me to be their pastor. I said, baby, I love you. I trust you. I always trust you. But I won't tell you everything that ever happens at the church. I won't tell you everything that ever happens. One, because I don't want it ever to taint you because it's never personal. Number two is it's refreshing to some say, sometimes say, I don't know what you're talking about. Come on. I mean, it's one of the greatest answers in the world. I don't know. <laughs> okay? You see, for them, they didn't know what they didn't know. They didn't know they were naked. They didn't know. Nakedness was normal. They were living in a state of what was normal for them. You see, this innocence, this innocence they lived in, this word means the lack of knowledge of something. How many know you can be innocent of knowing something? They were free from guile. They were free from cunning. They lacked worldly experience. How many of you want that for your children? Mm -hmm. That they would be free from that. You see, they were created by God to live in the garden free of evil and free of shame. That's how they were created. That was God's purpose. That was God's design for them. Now, we know the story. Let me read it to you. What, when the woman saw, after the serpent tempted her, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirable for making one wise, she took some of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, who was with her, Sometimes we forget that part, don't we, men? And he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened. And they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves waist coverings. Hmm. Isn't it a funny thing where our eyes will lead us? Have your eyes ever led you somewhere you shouldn't go? Have your eyes ever led you to something you shouldn't have partook in, looked at, saw, went, right? Man, there's something about that visual nature that causes us to have a, 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 a carnality, a lust, an appetite that just fuels that, right? No, we're Christians. And now as she looked at that fruit and she heard the words of the enemy, which were a lie, partial lie, she looks at that fruit and she sees it and it's beautiful and I can get wisdom from this. I want it. And then they ate. But here's what happened. Sin opened their eyes to what they had never known before. I, I wonder this morning, is there anybody in this house that would say that sin opened your eyes to something you never knew? No, we're Christians. Okay. Are there any redeemed people in here? Like redeemed from some sin or something. You guys want to drink? Just in case you're wondering, I can drink this and go to bed. Ah. But I'm not planning on going to bed. Listen to me. There were things you never knew until you took that first drug. There are things you never knew until you had that first drunkenness. There are things you never knew until you had that first kiss. There are things you never knew. Come on, how many know what I'm talking about? Hmm? That in our life, there are some things that became known to us by virtue of what we laid our eyes upon and then we partook of. You see, their eyes were now open to something they've never known. Oh my goodness, we're naked. Because of sin, what was once normal, now became abnormal. How many of you can ever, how many in here have ever had a relationship get tainted because of sin? Okay. I, I, gotta, get a, I gotta get a different crowd. Okay, you got, you got, you're my favorite. Don't tell the rest of them. That things that were once normal in your life became abnormal. Relationship became abnormal. Habits became unnormal. There's a bunch of things that became abnormal in your life because what was once normal now became abnormal. How many know that a rebellious child will create an abnormal relationship with their, children, with their parents? 
right? And now what was once normal for them was now abnormal. Because of sin, what once brought no shame now brought shame. The Bible says they were naked and had no shame. But now because they took from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, their eyes were opened and they realized they were naked and now shame came over them. Isn't it amazing how sin will bring shame into our life? Now they knew what they didn't know. Do you remember the day, whatever it might be, you can, figure, you can fill in the blank, that this blank now caused you to know what you never knew? And how many wished you then never knew it? One of the things you could go back and say, I wish I never knew. And now they didn't, now they knew what they didn't know. They now knew what they should have never even known. It was never meant for them to know they were naked and unashamed. They were never to feel this. They were to never know this. Their eyes were never to be open. Let me tell you something this morning. There are some things we were never meant to know. There are some things that God never wanted us to know. There are things that God has kept from us for our benefit. God didn't lock up the knowledge of good and evil to keep them from something good. He kept it so it would keep them from something bad. He said, when you eat of it, you will die. Innocence died. Shamelessness died. There was death that came into the world because of that. They were never, they should have never even, how many know there are things in your life you shouldn't even know? You see, innocence was lost. It's a terrible thing, we live in a world where adults prey upon children and rob their innocence. It's a horrible thing that we live in a world where children who are never supposed, never meant to know this kind of stuff at that age, they know it. It's a terrible age we live in in that stuff. But it's always been a part of the world. You see, when they finally said, you know what, God, no, I'll do what I want, when I want, how I want, the innocence that they were meant to live in was lost. And sin then brought the knowledge of nakedness. Nakedness brought a state of shame. And shame brought an attempt to cover themselves from their nakedness. How many have ever tried to cover your own sin? Well, if I just do enough good works, if I just do enough this and I just do enough that, and, and well, I did this yesterday, so I'll do this today. Anybody ever play that yo-yo game? In, out, in, out, in, out. And shame brought them the fear of God. You see, what once used to be normal was them interacting with God in the garden. Them entertaining and walking with God in the garden. Them presenting themselves to God. But how many know when we live in sin towards God, the last thing we want to do is present ourselves to God? And instead of, when they heard him, instead of presenting themselves to him, they hid from him. It's amazing how many people I've talked to in life that have said, oh, I can't come to church. If I come to church, the, 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 the roof might fall in. <laughs> well, I'll just tell you what. You come, we'll test the roof, okay? <laughs> like, it's amazing. We think that we can't come because we're too bad to come. Sin then brought the fear of God. You see, what happened for Adam and Eve is what happens to many of us. Innocence was lost at the hands of sin. In your lives, some of you here today, your innocence was lost at the hands of somebody else's sin. And I'm just not talking, I'm just not talking physically. I'm talking mentally. I'm talking emotionally. I'm talking about things you've heard, things you've seen, things you've experienced. That some of you have experienced things and you have lost innocence at the hands of the sin of somebody else. This was lost at the hands of their own sin. So now what does God do? The Bible tells us that God comes down and God looks for them and God can't find them and he calls out for them. And they said, we hid because we were naked and we were afraid. Who told you that you were naked? Hmm. How many know he really wasn't asking because he didn't know? 
It's like whenever your mother asks you a question, is there something you should have told me? <laughs> okay, can we narrow that down a little bit? I want to make sure I'm confessing to the right one. Like, I don't want to, I don't want, I, I, can I take the fifth? I'm going to incriminate myself on something else that I don't have to. I need to know what you're talking about. <laughs> it's like that story I told you many times. I'll tell you again. I'm standing in the old foyer. It's in 2000, 2001, maybe somewhere like that. I see Penny across the foyer, and she goes, I mean, that's not good, man. Did you forget to tell me something? Obviously. Obviously, I did. Did you forget? Obviously. What? You invited the whole church to the house for a pig roast and didn't tell me? Yeah, that'd be me. Yeah. Yeah, they're coming Friday. It'd be all right. You've got five days. Praise the Lord. <laughs> some questions aren't meant to really because, you know, some questions aren't a question of inquiry. It's more of an indictment. See, this innocence was lost at the hands of sin. God says, who told you you were naked? So what does God do? The Bible says this. And the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife, and he clothed them. They were clothed with fig leaves, okay? They were trying to sew some leaves together and cover things up, right? Something about that shame, something about that nakedness, something caused something. That, oh, my gosh. What once was no shame now caused shame. How do I cover this up? And then God takes this animal and kills it. You see, Adam and Eve, is this battery going dead? Adam and Eve lost their state of innocence at the hands of sin. But now the innocent would die at the hands of God to cover their nakedness. Do you see what God did? God killed the innocent animal, to cover the sin, to cover the nakedness, and to cover the shame of Adam and Eve. Hmm. Wow, how many think that just sounds unfair? Well, I'll tell you something. Sin always causes death of innocence. It always causes death of innocence. So God in his mercy and God in his grace and God in his incredible plan and wisdom he looks at man in their fallen state. He looks at man in their shame. He looks at man in their nakedness. He looks at him and he sees them. And he's willing to take another part of his creation. And he kills that creation. And he wraps now man in this skin to cover their nakedness. Adam and Eve lost their state of innocence at the hand of sin. But now the innocent would die at the hands of God in order to cover their shame. I'm going to cover your shame. They would now wear the skin of the innocent, even though they were guilty. Can I tell you something? Even though they wore the skin of the animal, they weren't innocent. How many of you can be acquitted from a crime that you're guilty of? How many of you can be pardoned from a crime that you're guilty of? The fact of the matter is, God covered them, but it didn't make them guiltless. God covered them, but it didn't make them innocent. Wearing the skin of the innocent did not make them innocent. Wearing the skin of the innocent didn't make them innocent. It made them covered. Right? Now, you say, where is he going? I'm getting there. Listen, I didn't preach last week. I got two stored up in me. Some will say he didn't preach this week. Like Adam and Eve, you and I were created to live in a state of innocence. We weren't created for sin. We weren't created to sin, amen? Are we going to sin? How many know we're the products of sinful flesh? But how many know God's design for us isn't sin? God's design is for us to live in a state of purity, in a state of, uh, of innocence. That is God's design for us, right? But the fact of the matter is, like Adam and Eve, sin opens our eyes to things we were to never know, Right? There are things you were never to know that sin has opened your eyes to. Like Adam and Eve, sin caused sin. Yeah, right, okay. Get the cross out of there. Brought shame. Or at least it should. Sometimes the tragedy isn't sin. 
The tragedy is no conviction of sin. The tragedy isn't always the sin, although it shouldn't be. The tragedy is that we have no shame for our sin. We have no remorse for our sin. We have no contrition. We have no conviction. It's a dangerous place when we get to a place where there's no conviction of sin. It's a dangerous place where we can dismiss it, cast it off, make excuses, right? And like Adam and Eve, we attempt, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> and one minute it's not working, the next minute it goes three slides. Like Adam and Eve, innocence was lost at the hands of sin. Now here's where it gets good. Come on, everybody say these two words. Ready? Okay, so some of you are really quick, some of you are a little slow. Okay. <laughs> but God, listen, you and I, we sin. There's shame involved. We're vulnerable. We try to cover it ourselves. We can't cover it. And here we are, left in a state of shamefulness. But God. But God. You see, because here's where it gets good for us as believers. But once again, God chose to shed the blood of the innocent for the guilty. That when he took his son, the Bible says he put him on the cross. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, so that who would ever believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. How many know this morning, he did that for the guilty. He did that for you, the guilty, me, the guilty. He did that. The innocent one went to the cross for the guilty ones. Once again, God shed the blood of the innocent to pay for the sin of the guilty. Listen to me. You're a blood bought born again child of God because of what Jesus did, what God did. God was not willing to scrap humanity and start over. God wanted to redeem humanity. And the only way he could redeem humanity was the bloodshed of his son. See, what happens is, the Bible tells me I become clothed. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. Oh my goodness. The Old Testament shows me where God killed an animal. He took that skin and he put that skin upon Adam and Eve. Now I've covered you with the garment of this animal. But now the Bible says he covers me with his son Jesus. That I am clothed in Christ. I am clothed with Christ. You see, and just because you wear the skin of the innocent doesn't make you innocent. You see, the fact of the matter is, I'm forgiven, but I'm not innocent. I'm redeemed, but I wasn't innocent. You see, sometimes in Christianity, we got this notion that I've been made innocent. No, you weren't made innocent. You were forgiven. You were atoned for. You made clean. But you were guilty. Wearing the, wearing the skin of the innocent one doesn't make me innocent. It makes me forgiven. How many ladies in here? And, and, and the, okay, but see, because I'll ask this question, and some of you will want to put your hand up, and then some of you will go, oh. okay? Just everybody relax on all of our current cancel culture, okay? What a bunch of garbage going on. To a point. How many of you, ladies might have, possibly, you don't have to raise your hand, you can just think in your mind, have fur coats? You know, some animal died and you're wearing it and somebody else wants to kill you because of that. <laughs> Listen, I got a dog, I'm wearing its hair all the time. <laughs> that stupid thing sheds the... <laughs> I'm telling you what, we're, we're, we've got a lake house down there, and we're, we're, the thing barks at everything, and Penny says, Penny, Penny, my wife Penny, dog lover Penny, is considering getting a collar that will shut that stupid thing up. I'll tell you right now, if I ever get my hands on that buzzer, that dog will be skinless, by the time, fairless by the time I'm done. Dog will be bald. But anytime you put on that fur coat, ladies, I'm going to tell you something, you do not become that animal. You do not become that animal. I don't know what God killed. Maybe he killed, let's just pretend he killed a deer in the garden. 
He put a deer skin coat on Adam and Eve. How many know they didn't become deer? They didn't become deer. Some of you wear cow hide leather. You don't become a cow when you wear it. I can put Jowdry's coat on today, but I ain't becoming Jowdry. <laughs> the world couldn't take two of you, brother. You see, you put on something, you don't become that. Wearing the skin of an animal didn't make Adam and Eve an animal. But wearing the skin of the innocent one makes us sons and daughters of God. Do you understand this morning that it does make us something we weren't? You see, the animal didn't make them an animal. But when I'm put on and I'm clothed with Christ, it makes me something I wasn't before that. You see, how many of you have ever heard this phrase? We're all God's children. No, we're not. We're all God's creation, but we ain't all God's children until we come to him through faith in Christ. Then we become sons and daughters of God Almighty. You see, oh, I must have hit the button again. I'm having a trouble with the day. Listen, there's a transaction that happens whenever you clothe yourself in Christ you become a new creation and you become something you never were. You never were. It's not something that we put on just to escape hell and get us into heaven. No, we put him on and he makes us a new creation. And he makes us sons, and he makes us daughters, and he makes us kings and priests to serve our God on the face of the earth. And when people see you, all of a sudden, it's like, whoa, there's something different about them. They're not like they used to be. Becker's not the jerk he used to be. He's just a better jerk now. I don't really mean that, you know that. <laughs> right? He's not the same person he once was. There's something different about him. There's something different about Frankie. What? Well, he said something. What did he say? Because I'm sure it was funny. Oh, my. <laughs> you see, you're not what you once were. Not because you go to church. Praise God, we go to church. Not because you do this, this, or this. No, no. You are different because of who now is upon you. That you are now clothed with Jesus. And you cannot, you see, because here's what you got to understand. When God clothed Adam and Eve with the skin of a garment, the animal was dead. But you now are wearing the living one. The one who is alive. And whose life becomes your life. And your life becomes his life. Come on, church. Aren't you glad that God, that God said, I'm not done with humanity. I'm going to redeem humanity. And I'm going to give them. And I'm going to pay for them. And I'm going to shed my son. And I'm going to clothe them with my son. You see, sin may indeed destroy innocence. But the innocent one defeated sin. He defeated sin. He defeated death. Come on, Troy. A little faster. You're not 50 yet. <laughs> yeah, what's that song? Somebody do, somebody do that. <laughs> I love this place. <laughs> totally. He said I was a bad influence. You and I were the skin of the innocent one. Therefore, let us live in the image of the innocent one. You, you see, come on, let's be honest. There are times, man, I'm saying, what is wrong with you? Anybody ever say that to yourself? Like, I don't say that to others because they'll give me a whole list of what's wrong with me. 
I'm not going to say it depending. What's wrong with me? But sometimes you look at yourself and say, what is wrong with you? What is wrong with you? God died for you. He sent his son for you. He redeemed you. Purchased you. His goodness followed you. He blessed your life, and yet you still act like an idiot sometimes. Can I get an amen? Not about me being an idiot, about you being an idiot. Right? You, you see, if I, if I have this right, Jowdry, tell me. If I don't, don't tell me. Who's going to rescue me from this wretched man of death? The Romans used to tie a dead body to the victim, to the person. And that dead, decaying body would be upon that person. And everything that was on that dead body would become infused with the living body. That's what they did it for. So it would become, the corpse would be rotting upon your flesh. Paul says, who's going to rescue me from this wretched man? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And now, he rescues me from it, not so I can go put it back on. He rescues me from it. So just as my body of sin would take on this body of corruption, where this rotting corpse would wear off on my body. Now, the life of Christ overcomes this body. And now my body becomes more like his life than death of sin. Galatians later on, I believe it was Galatians all the time. Therefore, put on Christ, put on kindness, goodness, compassion. Come on, how many of those are virtues? How, how many know that, as Peter talked about last week, that we need to throw off that sin that so easily entangles? Because how many know that sin that so easily entangles is not part of the garment of the innocent one? Innocence dies with sin, but the innocent one destroys sin. Stand with me. Stand with me. I'm going to close in a moment, but I want to mention something. Why didn't you text me an hour ago? Many of you know this, you heard this, you, know, you all know about the, the explosion that happened down in Tyrone. Crazy. But we have a, a lady in the church here named Tammy Topar. She lived in the second story of that house that exploded. All right? And she wasn't there, thankfully. Praise God for that. There was a lady in the bottom that lost her life. Um, but she lost everything. Tammy lost everything. Okay? She's fine, looking for a new place to live. But let me say this to you, church. We want to help her. Okay? She's got to get everything new. But let me say this to you. The best way we can help her are two things. Cash and gift cards. Cash and gift cards is the best way we can help her, folks. Uh, she, what she doesn't need is a whole bunch of stuff that she has to later on get rid of. <laughs> I know we, we try to be nice. We try to be good. And that's all well and good. But the fact of the matter is, let's, let's bless her with cash and let's bless her with gift cards. And so let me tell you what you can do. If you want to give cash to the church, you can. Just put it in the envelope. Put it in the box. Mark it for Tammy. And we'll make sure she gets it, all right? If you want to start bringing some gift cards in next week and you want to put them in the box, we'll make sure she gets those. But we want to bless her. We want to help her get back on her feet. Amen? All right? God bless you. Thank you for that. Um, but today, I'm going to close with this. You and I, we were the guilty ones. We were the guilty ones. We were like Adam and Eve. And there was a time in our life where sin destroyed the innocence with which God created us to live. There are some in this house that, again, I said before, that there is an innocence that was destroyed at the hands of somebody else's sin. God heals that. 
And God will use that. He did not ordain it. He did not plan it. He did not allow it. And it was not his idea. I'm going to tell you that. And that stuff is from the pit of hell. Listen to me, young lady. I don't know why I'm saying this. I don't know. Young lady, young man, that person who violated you, that was God had nothing to do with that. That was from the pit of hell. That was the sin of a person that first sinned against God and then sinned against you and caused pain. God never said to that person, it's okay to do that. And God never allowed it. Like some people teach, well, God allowed that to bring out some divine purpose. That's stupid. (laughs) But God can heal that. And God will use it if you will allow him. But I want to say to you this morning, God has created a garment for us, the guilty ones. And that garment is his son, Jesus. That we would clothe ourselves with Christ. That we would clothe ourselves with the innocent one. Not making us innocent, making us forgiven, making us sons, making us daughters. How do I do that, pastor? How do I do that? Let me tell you how you do it. It's simple. It's so simple. You just look at God and you just say, God, I come to you and I repent of my sin. I believe that you killed your son. I believe that you shed his blood for me. I believe today that you shed the uh, blood of the innocent son for my sin. And Lord, I accept that gift, that gift of salvation. I believe in my heart that you raised Jesus from the dead. And now I want to live in the newness of what it is to live clothed with Christ. I want to be a son and I want to be a daughter. And it's that simple, isn't it, Pastor? It's that simple. So close your eyes with me. Bow your heads. Don't be peeking. I would say this to you. Stop running and put on the garment. Stop running and put on the garment he's holding for you. When the prodigal came home, daddy had a coat waiting. God wants to clothe you today with his son. So in a moment, and I'm not going to trick you and do raise the hand and come forward thing. But in a moment, I'm going to count to three. And if you're in this house and you say, I want to be clothed in the innocent one, I want you to raise your hand. I want to be clothed with Christ, the innocent one who died for me, the guilty one. And so one, two, three. Now, oh, lots of hands across this room. Lots of hands across this room. Father, you see every hand in this house this morning. Some are doing it for the first time. Some are doing it for the second or third time some are doing it just because they're just once again looking at you and say I want all you have for me and father it was it was it was in that garden where we see your goodness chasing after Adam and Eve even in their sin your goodness chased after them your goodness caused you to kill the animal and cover them and this day there are hands in this house there are people in this house that say I don't want to any longer be clothed in my own righteousness I want to be clothed in the righteousness of Christ I've sewn my fig leaves together long enough I've tried to cover myself long enough I've tried to cover my own sin long enough but this day I'm going to clothe myself in Christ in his righteousness and that clothing makes you a son and a daughter of God most high.
All across this room, say this with me. Lord, I thank you for shedding the blood of your innocent son to cover and atone for my guilt. Thank you for forgiving me. And this day, I choose to cover myself with Christ.